Bon dia a tothom. Good morning. Presentem aquestes jornades que es divideixen en unes sessions d'ara al dematí i després una altra sessió a la tarda que col·laborem amb el projecte In Sergio Freedom, amb l'associació també Beletrina d'Eslovènia, la Universitat de Barcelona i també la Fundació Cipriano García, que ens acompanya la Rosa Sants, que estàs per aquí, no sé on està, aquí darrere el Ricard. I és un projecte que porta pel tema de la transnacionalitat, aquesta memòria comparada, aquestes històries comparades, que sempre és el nostre referent permanent de l'Observatori Europeu de Memòries d'aquí de la Universitat de Barcelona. També agrair aquesta casa, com sempre, la nostra casa, la sessió dels espais, i, òbviament, agrair també l'assistència dels professors que m'acompanyen avui en aquesta taula. Començarem amb la professora també d'aquesta casa, catedràtica, Mary Naix, companya i amiga, que ens parlarà d'un cas, diguéssim, comparat també amb el que passava i aquests imaginaris del maig de 68, i realment a veure què passava en un país com aquí, òbviament, que també es buscava moltes llibertats, sobretot al carrer, i no les institucions, perquè estàvem vivint una dictadura que el 68 encara semblava que no s'acabaria mai, per dir-ho d'alguna manera. Després el professor Clàssic i el professor Seca, també, de la Universitat de Zagreb i de la Universitat de Varsòvia, que, diguéssim, amb aquesta espècie de casos comparats, ens presentaran una miqueta com funcionaven aquests moviments també, buscant llibertats, noves aspiracions polítiques, socials, econòmiques, de gènere, etcètera, etcètera, a la Iugoslàvia del 68 i a la Polònia també del 68. Penso que el nivell d'aquest projecte és molt interessant, de fet és un projecte també cofinançat com altres dels nostres projectes per al programa Euro for Citizens de la Comissió Europea i d'alguna manera, sense enrotllar-me més, i abans de donar-li la paraula a la professora Meni Naix, doncs recordar-vos que sou molt benvinguts també al nostre treball interdisciplinar de l'Observatori i que el que s'ha de fer precisament és intentar buscar aquest intercanvi d'experiències i aquest intercanvi a nivell de projectes diuen de bones pràctiques, però sobretot dels processos de la història i de la memòria que conflueixen d'un costat i l'altre de la nostra Europa tan convulsa i que, a més a més, sembla que tampoc acaba de superar les múltiples i múltiples crisis des de fa tantes dècades. I, a més a més, aquestes efemèrides que sempre també aprofitem i, per què no, aquests programes europeus d'història i de memòria aprofiten aquestes efemèrides, els 50 anys del 68 en aquest cas i en aquest projecte, però també altres tantes efemèrides que celebrarem. Recordar que farem també moltes activitats aquí a Barcelona properament sobre el tema d'una altra efemèride, els bombardejos de la capital catalana i no només de la capital catalana, i esperar que les jornades siguin molt fructíferes i que també seguirem a la tarda en una altra aula d'aquesta casa. Moltes gràcies, també gràcies a l'Oriol per l'ajut i la coordinació i a l'equip de l'Observatori i també al públic que heu vingut i que penso que trobareu molt interessant les conferències d'avui. No m'enrotllo més i, Meri, tens la paraula. I would like to open the debate, perhaps. Do we have a valid understanding of what we understand to be May 1968 as a watershed in European history? Um, is the meaning of the historic date of May 1968, which is uh, generally presented as a turning point in the political map of Europe, is that valid for all of Europe today? Um, so perhaps my argument might be that we need a more pluralistic understanding of the meta narratives of European history uh, that may give rise to and nuances and a different approach or different approaches in plural to the understanding of May 1968. So that would be the first uh, aspect of the debate which we may have afterwards. In the case of Spain and Catalonia, May, my argument would be, May 1968 was not a watershed in the political history of Spain. Um, and indeed, the singularity of the case we have uh, under debate today in the case of Spain, 
is based on the long dictatorship by Franco. Um, so this may account for the distinctiveness of the approach to protest, to social protest, here in Spain at the time. Now it is true that under the Franco dictatorship, there were underground trade unions, political opposition, student <coughs> resistance, and emerging feminism that challenged uh, the established order. But again, perhaps my argument would be that, generally speaking, this challenge is focused uh, through the idea of a political struggle against Franco and achieving freedom and democracy. So perhaps in search of freedom means or has a reading more focused on politics than in the context of Paris 1968. And talking of May 1968 in Paris and the protests there, um, in general, they have been described as forming part of what is known as the new social movements of the 1960s. They emerged alongside the struggles for civil rights in the US and in Ireland, pacifism, women's liberation, anti-colonial movements, and others. And it is generally argued that they are based on informal submerged networks. They practice dissidence through informal organizations and non-hierarchical leadership. The leading pl players in May 1968 were young, disenchanted Europeans who fought against the establishment and then worked against, to some extent, the traditional leadership of the workers, but also they were inscribed within the labor movement. In contrast to the hierarchy entrenched in trade unions and left political parties that required restraint, unwavering affiliation, and discipline, the young nonconformist activists in 1968 rejected clear leadership, although there were leaders, and political control. These forms of organization were flexible and encapsulated self-management, informal membership, and flexible action. They are also very highly associated to collective identities, collective identities that foster the notion of belonging, of belonging to an imagined student community. These young, nonconformist students challenged capitalism, the political system, consumer society, cultural standardization, alienation. So this youthful nonconformism, I would say, I would argue, is an essential part, a crucial part of the protests of May 1968. There's also another aspect I would like to, to discuss, which is the idea that um, there was an existential questioning of the meaning of life and freedom. So that the search for freedom in the case of the students, the youth of May 1968 had to do with disenchantment with life an existential questioning. They were rebels without a cause, would one think. That was 19, the 1958 film. But by then, they had gained a certain idea of an undefined cause, would be my argument. Um, in this sense, as I, I mentioned, the idea of existential questioning, to my mind, is very crucial. And here we have the quotation from Dutschke, who said at the time that May 1968 was basically sustained by existential disgust with a society that chatters on and on about freedom while subtly and brutally oppressing the immediate interests and needs of individuals and the people fighting for their socio-economic emancipation. The anti-authoritarian students aim to change society, to develop a new age, a new age that there in, at the same time was very much in line with the new technologies in their way of protesting. And here I would go back to the 1964 Marshall McLuhan's classic work and the famous um, phrase that he coined, the medium is the message. 
In other words, in asserting the centrality of the media, a notable example of this kind, this form of protest, to my mind, is the development of innovative practices, collective imaginary, and at the same time, new representations and the use of the media to communicate dissent, like we have here in many of the images. And in this case as well, I also want to uh, comment on the social performativity that, to my mind, is also central to the social protests of 1968. Um, social protests that, as we see, used slogans, chants in the streets, and from the images we have here, all the symbolic symbols involved with that. And social performativity, as I've mentioned, to my mind is central. And here I have the quote from Ironman, who um, states that social movement is a form of acting in public, a political performance which involves representation in dramatic form as movements engage emotions inside and outside their bounds, attempting to communicate their message. So we're talking about the ability to communicate their message, a political public performance which involves drama, which involves um, representation. And this, to my mind, is my understanding of what the social protest of May 1968 is. Um, and that, to my mind, is what I will use to understand what happens in the case of Spain. Is it a social performance? Is it non-conformance? Is it counter-cultural? Counter Does it engage with emotions? Is it uh, a non-defined protest in its goals? Um, and here we would have, before I go on, an example of what I understand to be social performance. Drama on the streets, engaging with masks. This is really, uh, a, 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 a thinking in terms of the time, attracts the attention and also attracts the attention of the media. And finally, my argument would be that, um, following on Melucci, that the freedom, the search of freedom involved in, in 19, May 1968 in Paris would be or could be understood in terms of freedom to be. Freedom to be. Freedom to be, not to achieve, not to achieve political rights and democ democracy, but freedom to be. Freedom to be free from the social conventions of the time in the case of the nonconformist students. Now, in contrast, in the case of Spain, the um, Franco dictatorship <coughs> leaves very little room for subtle oppression that causes existential disgust, asco existencial. Franco Spain was blatant in its subjugation, in its um, absolute power, in its unremitting repression that eradicated fundamental rights for 40 years. And just a reminder that in September 1975, shortly before his own death, Franco had his last five victims executed by firing squad. So that is the degree of repression that we have at the time. And another feature I would like to bring to mind is how the Franco state was based on a national Catholicism, as we know very well, but it also set up a patriarchal gender system grounded on male hierarchy as a corner of the new state. Um, a corner of the new state that set up laws, legislation, that openly and blatantly subjugated and oppressed women. And I think that is also to be taken into consideration when we talk about the feminism, feminist movement that emerges at the same time in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And as well, the Franco regime not only used law and order and repression, but it also implemented a new representation of feminine identity, female identity, as what is known as the perfecta casada, the perfect married lady, the lady who is totally dedicated to the family, to the children, to her husband, and totally subjugated <coughs> to them. 
So there is a representation of what women's role is in society and what their identity is, which will be one of the, uh, I think, very clear reactions and reconstitution reconst uh, of a new identity by the feminist movement that will take place at the time. So it will be a re reaction to the Francoist um, view of women. Um, the universe of the left is complex, and I do not have time to go into it in much detail. But indeed, in Spain, um, the repression left very little room, as I mentioned, for existential discussion or for countercultural movements. Um, again, the left in Spain was generally founded on orthodox Marxism, socialism, and even though, as was, is well known, there was a minority radical left of Trotskyists, Maoists, Marxist Leninists, they did not highlight a revolutionary agenda um, that included critical debates on consumer society, on social conventions, as manifestations of power. Um, the strong political identity of the left meant that the workers' movement, trade unionism, and the political and the and, and uh, left politics, so that the working class, the left, represented a social class that had been um, harshly defeated and suffered stark repression. So their agenda, their goal, was amnesty, uh, the overthrow of the Franco regime, and the establishment of freedom and liberty and rights. And the fact that they worked in underground context, all their operations were secretive, clandestine, that also meant that leadership was a very clear issue. Hierarchy, leadership, discipline, unquestioning acceptance of order shaped the clandestine world of the left. Why? Because of the harsh repression. There was no way there could be self-management, open discussions, open debates at the time. And if there was some, if, some idea of um, social performance, social performativity, um, here we have Santiago um, Carillo, the head of the Communist Party. And it is true that he appeared in a wig in, uh, uh, in Spain. Uh, but this was not social performance. It was simply uh, in order to be able to go over the border to get into Spain disguised. So I don't think one can take a reading in, on those terms. It is not the mass that we have seen in the images of the protests of 1968. The student movement. Yes, we could attempt to find issues of con counter culture there. But at the same time, it's also a clandestine left under the dictatorship. So again, although there are recitals, some new forms of practices of activism, like sit-ins at the universities, etc., the um, idea that f of freedom was associated with the end of the dictatorship in most cases. So there isn't a mental map, if you wish, that allows them to develop counter-culture values at the time. There were, of course, readings readings in this university at the time of Marcuse, of um, uh, photocopies that came in an underground way to discuss things. But again, I would argue that um, despite the capacity to mobilize, um, Martha Harnecker, I don't know if there's anybody here who actually read her, but the seminars and the discussions were based on a book by Martha Harnecker, which is a, very, a simple compendium of Marxism. And this is what we were reading rather than, and I say we because I was there at the time, and rather than Marcuse, if you like. Marcuse also circulated, but this was really the way the, the, the major uh, contact and readings that students had at, at the time. Um, there were, as I mentioned earlier, student movements. Uh, in fact, before 68, in 1966, the major movement in, in Barcelona was what is known as the Capuchinada, when the young Catalan students at the universities of, Bar of Barcelona, um, they had a sit-in together with some intellectuals in the monastery of the Capuchinos, the Capuchin Monastery in Pedralbes. And um, during that period where they, they were um, having the sit-in, as you can see, 
dress formally in their suits and in, on, in their ties. Remember that when students had exams uh, at that period in the late 60s, early 70s, the day of the exam they would wear suits and ties. So this is, this is what's happening here at the time. Um, of, although we may see some photos of young men in corduroy jackets, which is also associated aesthetically with the left. Uh, as you can see from these images, these are, you know, the well-dressed, serious, and even to some extent conventional students, in the sense that they were, their fight was the fight against Frank. Now, there is a space where there is some counterculture, which would be more in association with um, May 1968, La Gauche Divine. Um, and in fact, it's, it's actually, uh, uh, I think, quite significant that they call, they use the French word, la gauche divine, the, the <coughs> divine left. Um, now, what are the characteristics of this group? Um, it was a sh very short-lived cultural movement that included intellectuals, writers, artists, filmmakers, uh, models, photographers, architects, designers. And where were they from? They basically came from the progressive circles, but of the middle and particularly the upper class, cosmopolitan families of Barcelona. So there were the young generation of rebels against their own families, who were nonconformist in their way of behaving. They would behave specifically in what was termed at the time non-conventional, scandalous behavior. They were bohemians. They were night owls. Here what we have is um, <clears throat> Colita. Uh, she, that's a more recent one. She was one of the main photographers of the time. And this is one of the photos of the time, which indeed obviously disconcerted uh, well-being uh, um, Barcelona society of the time. And these were some of the photos they used uh, that, she, that were published. And here we have um, Teresa Gimpero, the model that represented uh, um, the Gauche Divine. Now, they came from the Barrio Alto, the upper class. They would meet in the famous discotheque um, Boccaccio. Uh, and they would spend the summers in the chalets on the Costa Brava in Begu. So this is where they're at. But they are the nonconformists. They fit in a lot better with May 1968. But they were also considered as superficial posture is from the perspective of the serious left that fought against Franco. Now we do have other elements as well. The anarchist movement, what can we do about that? Anarchism, as you know, was indeed until um, the post-war period, one of the major um, um, groups within the Spanish working class movement. Now anarchists as well, they also looked to the past. They were the defeated in the Civil War, and the anarchists had reemerged that were present in the late 60s, 1970s. Their framework was the Civil War. Their framework was the dictatorship. They were not at all happy with the idea of counterculture and nonconformism at the time. So that was their reference. But however, by 1977, so we're speaking further down the line, um, there is a revival, if you wish, in, in Barcelona, in, with the um, li uh, Jornadas Libertarias, with the, um, in 1977 in July, um, this conference or this meeting of libertarians in Barcelona, held particularly in the Parque Güell, and this took on a countercultural aspect and features. They debated on art, education, urban development, feminism, ecology. They were filmmakers, trade unionists, feminists, who took part in this. And they in, in attempted to establish an alternative culture that, was, that advocated nonconformism, activist outlook on life, and it was celebratory. Uh, Pepe Rivas, who was the uh, director of Ajo Blanco at the time, uh, he uh, related this experience in 1977 to an intersection of the experiences of exiled libertarians in, of the 1930s May 1968, and the Latin American anarchist movement of the time. 
Um, and there is, a, 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 indeed, a, I think, a very, very strong difference. There is no existential disgust. This is a joie de vivre. Right? This is a hopeful uh, experience of life. It is very optimistic in approach. It's not a rejection of the, uh, as we have seen in the case of the 68, of conventions in the sense of oppression. No, no, this is a way of looking to the future, which in that case, uh, um, I, do, I do not think it fits in to what um, Bay 68 would be. And there are over 600 visitors to it. And also, um, I just wanted to mention that there is a link with feminism here, because in the 1977 meetings and in, in the Parque Güell of the Libertarians, Mujeres Libres, the, the women's organization, that had re-emerged uh, by then in 1976, uh, took part. Um, this group, which uh, is quite singular in, 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 in the fact that it is uh, an organization that re-emerges in contact with the organization from the 1930s, this, the war organizations. And here, again, we can speak of the tension, the generational tension. The older um, Mujeres Libres, free women, they look to the civil war, to politics, to more doctrinal ideology. And the young feminists were nonconformists. They were talking about um, sexuality. Uh, they were talking about sexual free freedom, life-affirming attitudes. Uh, so this is another aspect of what we can speak about there. And then finally, in my remarks, um, um, the women's movement of the time. Now, um, it has been argued quite forcefully that the women's movement is um, a direct legacy of May 1968. Françoise Pic uh, has argued, and she argued in 2008, for example, um, that uh, we have to understand the feminist movement, and I'm quoting, as a legacy of May 68 since it has reincorporated the political conceptions, forms of organization, and variety of actions that came from the May 1968 movement. Now, um, I disagree with that uh, understanding of the women's movement in Spain and Catalonia at the time. Again, why? Uh, because... Because, again, it was in the context of the dictatorship. So on one of the aspects of the women's movement is the fact that it is politically oriented. It is within a political culture of opposition to the Franco regime. And the apprenticeship, the learning process to later become feminist, also comes from the fact that they are organized within the clandestine movement against Franco. And also, they have a very clear perception of the oppression by the Franco regime on women, as this will show you there, you know, the penal code, the civil code, and the law against what was called social, social dangers, which had to do with homosexuality, uh, which were the Franco laws uh, against uh, women, which um, uh, oppressed them directly, as I mentioned earlier. And this is another example of it, so that the women's movement emerges precisely to eliminate the Franco regime and achieve freedom. And I think it's also quite um, significant that uh, amnesty uh, is on the agenda of the women's movement very clearly. Now, they, uh, the amnesty is on the general um, agenda of the opposition movement against Franco in, in the transition pe period. But my argument is that the women's movement, the feminist movement, redefined their understanding of amnesty. So we could speak in terms of a feminist amnesty, a new reconceptualization of what amnesty should be. And in, 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 in this case, uh, this amnesty is defined or redefined uh, not just as amnesty for those um, people who are the, the people who are imprisoned because of their political activism but also the women who are in prison because of the specific Franco laws against women. And so in this case, there is, I think, a, a very wide definition, and it's also a political definition. I'm going to read a quote, which I don't quite remember whether I have it with me or not. I don't think so here. Um, from um, 
1977 statement of the journal Donna Sinjuita, the feminist uh, journal, it said in this definition of feminist amnesty, um, it, embracing a wide range of demands, it says, fighting for an amnesty for women is fighting the role they want to impose on us fighting for the right to our own body and our own identity. It is fighting discrimination in prisons. It is fighting for our dignity as people to stop being fodder for reproduction, fodder for consumption, and repositories of male honor. So I think that definition gives us some insight as to um, what the agenda of the women's movement is. To, it resonates somewhat with 1968, uh, in the sense that no impositions, the right to their own body, the right uh, for their own identity, identity politics as we have seen is central to these movements. Uh, it's also fighting the discriminative uh, women of, in, in prisons, dignity, and of course the specific issues that the women's movement will develop. For example, um, they no longer want to be repositories of male honor and fodder for reproduction. And these are the some of the main uh, goals that the women's movement attempt to achieve at the time. And I think this is very well expressed by uh, Nuria Pompeia, that the identity assigned by the Franco regime, the perfect married lady, is being very clearly questioned here. And it's being clearly questioned from the major aspect of the women's movement, that is, and the, ma the major achievement, that the personal is political. So they have a political identity fighting against Franco, but their uh, feminist identity also emerges at the time from the personal that uh, establishes that the site of female repression is precisely the family, the home, and the personal. And I think this is very well um, seen through this. There were many of them at the time, but um, I think that... Um, Nuria Pompeo was, 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 was uh, very, very incisive in her um, visual, visualization of this. And this was achieved to, um, this is another aspect, to identify women's oppression. Now, this was the malaise without a name that Betty Friedan had spoken about. Rebels without a cause. <coughs> but now, this cause is being identified very clearly, and the site of oppression is no longer just assigned to the Franco dictatorship, but also to the personal relationships within the families. And I think this, this is rather uh, important to, to remember. It is based on experience. It's not imagined. I, I would probably argue that the students of uh, 68, it was an imagined oppression to some extent, conventions in society that they resisted. In the case of women, this develops out of their shared experience, which is what will lead on to actually establishing uh, a major social movement of the time. Um, and just to, to give you um, other ideas about that, I mean, how this is visualized, um, and the notion I wanted to go back to finally, to performativity. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I understand social performativity to be one of the the, the, the major um, uh, ideas behind the May 1968 movement, and I think this happens here. Um, going back. Uh, one, uh, something happened here. Anyway, uh, one of the campaigns by the feminist movement was the campaign against um, um, the uh, penalization of adultery. Uh, just to remind us there, of those who are not familiar with it, um, under the Franco regime, women were severely penalized for adultery, could go to jail because of that, whereas the men were not. And there was a specific case in 1976 where a working class woman um, had been, um, uh, she had uh, been married, had a daughter, had, uh, I'm gone on, aren't I? Okay, not to worry. Um, and so her, and her husband had abandoned her, but when she had a second child with another partner, he reappeared and claimed the daughter, and then, and then she was put on trial, and she was to lose her child. Now, I think the inter interesting feature here is the interclass connection. This woman, who was um, from a working class um, area, 
she did not go to the left-wing parties or to the trade unions. She went to the feminist movement to defend her, which she did, and she was hidden by the feminist movement. And there was a big campaign in Barcelona at the time. Now, the interesting thing I want to talk about here is that the identity politics behind it. One of um, the ways of, um, of, of uh, the protest was uh, women coming along and with the placard saying, I am also an adulterist, <coughs> um, which were the images, but I can't go back to them, I don't think, no? that I had shown here of, of significant women within, um, this is Maria Angeles Munoz, no, it's not happening, is it? There we go. Okay, uh, this is social performance, and I think that is one of the ingredients of the feminist movement. However, and finally, um, social performance, um, cultural artifacts, we find that that is the calendar, the first one of the first uh, feminist calendars. And my final question would be, now has this got to do with May 1968, or is it another legacy? So what do we do? I mean, are they, are we really speaking about the grandchildren of the suffragists? Because with the suffragists in 1918, 1916, 1918, um, decades earlier, we have social performativity, I think. Maybe it hasn't been recognized as such, but they performed in public. They, public. they were transgressive. They had transgressive public actions. They dressed up. Uh, they had their bands, they had their uniforms. Um, in the street, in public, they performed transgression and protest, public protests. Um, different uh, ways of understanding that public meetings are, as many of them did, tomatoes, stones thrown at politicians, etc. So they occupied the public arena, they gained notoriety, they behaved scandalously in the light of the times, they attracted media attention. So the media is the message then in 1918, or perhaps we could think in terms of that the women's movement um, uh, is not just a legacy of May 1968, but it has a long, long previous history before that, and I think it's up to us as historians to go back and identify and see what are the commonalities and what are the differences regarding uh, May 1968 and the protests. Thank you.